Hey guys, what's up? It's Ripe again in today's video. My abusive entitled family abandoned me when I was young and now demands I pay for everything they want after I worked myself up the food chain and made something out of myself. In the end, I gave them what they wanted in order to destroy and outsmart them. Here is what I did. Let's dive right into the story. Many people may say that family is a blessing, but what they don't say is that they can also be a curse. And in my case, the family that should have loved and protected me instead hated and disowned me for no fault of my own. From a very young age, I was the subject of neglect from parents that would rather gamble and drink than take care of me and this only got worse as I got older. When I turned 7 years old, my brother vanished and my parents could not care less. After an investigation, the police dropped them as prime suspects and life went on as if my brother never existed, back into the daily cycle of alcohol-induced rages or lottery losses. Many years later, I managed to free myself a little bit when I moved out for college, where I met my girlfriend, which is now my wife. It was sad to see that my family had no love for her either, often using her as a target for racist abuse or unwarranted complaints. This proved to be the final straw, as after I graduated, I finally cut ties with my family, to which they only became more angry and inhospitable. Two years later my life was finally on the up and I had been scouted for a great position in a tech company and we were moving out of a tiny apartment into a quaint house in the suburbs. That all changed when my company made a grave error by sending a payslip to an old address which was my parents house. Shortly after I was made aware of the slip up I got a call from my parents, the first one since I disowned them and they sounded like they had been replaced by imposters. Additionally, before I forget to mention this because otherwise some parts of the story might make no sense, so I managed to make some good investments in my adult life which paid off and some would consider me wealthy or even rich. I was very lucky with this and I feel very fortunate to be in this financial position as well as having a well-paying decent job. Everything that I had previously known about them had supposedly changed. They were now apologetic, polite and suspiciously friendly. They had gotten my mail and asked to drop it over, which I reluctantly allowed but did not tell them my address. In a complete absence of character, they were still proving to be nice people, very suspicious when I knew their real faces. Cutting the small talk, I asked for my mail, to which they returned sheepish looks handing over an empty envelope. They stuck to the story that the envelope had always been empty even though a glint in their eye gave me serious doubts. Frustrated I turned to leave when they held me back, their true aim now apparent as they forced documents of late rent into my hands. I had no intention to pay it, yet by some magic or ingrained childhood conditioning I found myself unable to refuse them when they swapped from begging to demanding, past events flashed by me from deep trauma. They then let me go shortly after. Despair hung over me like a black cloud for most of the week thereafter and I broke down when I recalled to my wife later what had happened. The only silver lining we could agree on was that it was probably just a one-time thing. Because I could easily get my details changed at work so the mistake would not be repeated. Just as I had begun to feel like my old self again, I received another phone call the following week. My parents wanted something else. This time they lamented my treatment throughout childhood and encouraged me to arrange a holiday we could all go on together as a family with very strong suggestions of the Bahamas. As the necessity and urgency of their plea turned into a strict demand, I faked a bad signal and put the phone down, struggling with the idea of conflict. The phone rang six more times over the next hour before it finally finally fell silent. After a long and reassuring talk with my wife that evening, we agreed I would answer them next time and finally stand up for myself. The next morning I was in the office when I heard their chilling voices again, answering a call I expected was my wife. Strangely though, they did not mention the idea of a vacation again, maybe smarter than to push their luck on something I had already denied. Their request this time again tucked on feelings of familial love that I knew never existed even though they tried their best. They wanted to move out of their dilapidated apartment to be closer to me to reunite our dear family, which was utter crap. Directing me cordially to a website they showed me the idea for their new house, a mega mansion in the suburbs. I tried to tell them how it was nowhere close but to every objection I had they had a perfect excuse to use against me. 
After a heated few minutes of back and forth, I told them plainly, I'm not buying this, to a response of immediate outcry and resent. Unlike the vacation they repeatedly asked for, the house calling day and night in a war of attrition. What started off as one sporadic call from the once per month when their bills came due now turned to daily pestering as they turned to me for every little need they had. I regretted ever letting them back into my life, but now I knew that roaches like these people would not be so easy to get rid of. I tried once to refuse them gently, only then to be met with hysterics and an abundance of manufactured guilt as they tried forcing me to dance to their tune. If saying no was not possible, I needed another way to be rid of them. As I sullenly focused on my dilemma, one evening my mutually suffering wife approached me with a crazy scheme of her own, born from her experience as an estate lawyer. So the next week I stopped by my parents' house as a surprise, carrying with me a whole stack of important documents. They got confused by the big words on the paper, so I had to explain it carefully to them. I was buying them the house they wanted, I tried to say more, but they only heard what they wanted to, so I gave up with the details. All they needed to do was sign it and it would be theirs completely. What they did not read though was that after the first payment the mortgage and all its fees would be their responsibility. A month later my wife and I decided to go on that vacation after all, relaxing on a beach in the Bahamas when we got a panicked voicemail, mostly belligerent except for their favorite word, money. I did not return their call and we had a lovely extended trip. When I returned home, I was greeted by the news of their arrest which had been plastered over the local morning news. Unsurprisingly to me, they had refused to cooperate during their eviction and even got violent resulting in the intervention of police and reinforcements. The last time I ever heard from them, they begged me for help, for a lawyer, for anything. I said okay, but first I wanted a fresh start and my childhood back. Update to the story, many of you were asking me for an update on my story and what happened to my family after they got evicted and got violent with the police. I left out some details in the original story because it was difficult for me to overcome the trauma and talk about it. Anyway, here we go. So the sun was beating down on the courthouse steps as I made my way inside, my heart pounding with a mixture of excitement and nerves. After years of abuse and neglect, I was finally going to get justice. I had spent countless hours working with the prosecutor to build a strong case against my entitled family members and I knew that the evidence we had was overwhelming. As I took my seat in the courtroom, I watched as my family members were let in, their heads down and their faces filled with shame. They looked nothing like the proud and entitled family that had tormented me for years. Instead they were disheveled and defeated, a far cry from the people who had once held power over me. The legal consequences of their actions were severe. The charges against them included fraud, extortion and assault. They had attempted to extort money from me by falsifying documents and when I refused to comply with their demands they had resorted to violence. Also, they attacked my pregnant wife simply because they did not like her skin color and did not want a mixed race baby in the family. The court had also uncovered evidence of their involvement in the disappearance of my older brother years ago, something that had haunted me for years. The trial was long and arduous, filled with testimony and evidence that made my blood boil. My family members tried to deny their wrongdoing, but the prosecutor was relentless, exposing their lies and deceit at every turn. As the days went by, it became clear that the judge was not gonna go easy on them. The judge handed down a sentence that was fitting for their crimes. My parents received a long prison sentence while my other family members were given a variety of sentences ranging from probation to prison time. As they were led away in handcuffs, I could not help but feel a sense of satisfaction. Finally, they were going to pay for the pain and suffering they had inflicted on me. But even as I watched them being taken away, I could not shake the feeling of anger and hurt that had been with me for so long. I thought about my older brother who had disappeared so many years ago. The court had uncovered evidence that suggested my family members had played a role in his disappearance and the thought of what they might have done to him filled me with a sense of dread. In the weeks that followed I worked closely with the police to try and uncover the truth about what had happened to my brother. We dug through old records, interviewed witnesses and even conducted searches of my family members' properties. And eventually we found what we were looking for. Hidden away in a dusty old box in my parents' attic was a stack of old letters and photos that shed new light on my brother's disappearance. It seemed that my family members had been involved in a scheme to defraud my brother of his inheritance and when he had threatened to go to the police, they had made him disappear. 
The discovery was shocking and it left me reeling with a mixture of anger and sadness. But it also gave me a sense of closure knowing that I finally had the answers I had been searching for all these years. As I walked out of the courthouse, I could not help but feel a sense of relief. I was finally free of my entitled family and I could start a new chapter in my life. One where I could be surrounded by love and support and something that had been missing from my life for far too long. And even though the road ahead would be long and difficult, I knew that I had the strength and determination to make it through. And yeah, ripe stars, that is how the story concludes. I'm glad for OP that he finally got some closure in the end, and I really hope that this entitled family stays locked up for a long, long time. Either way, if you enjoyed the story, please don't forget to like the video and maybe even post a comment, because that would help me tremendously. Thank you so much. And the next one is titled Google Revenge. So I got a cousin who is called Mac whose picture is next to the word self-righteous in the dictionary. He is not alone in my extended family. If there is a gene for self-righteousness and pestering other people about their lives, most of my relatives have it once. Thankfully, a few blessed relatives don't have it at all. Mac, though, definitely has both of those self-righteous gene alleles. This guy is even a pastor, apologies to any pastors, but you probably know the kind of guy I mean. Backstory, which may interest some of you, but likely not too many, Mac grinds my gears and though it is not directly relevant to what he did to inspire my petty revenge, readers may be more satisfied with what happens to him if they know a couple of other things about him. So Mac has made it his personal mission to make sure everyone around him is on the straight and narrow path. While admirable, he has managed to implement good intentions in the most bizarre are ineffective ways possible. His young son with his wife Tiffany is not allowed to interact with my dad because my dad is divorced. My dad is also a great person and an interesting guy to be around but that does not matter because apparently divorce is a nasty communicable disease. Mac also believes that demons are constantly tempting us and any deviation from said straight and narrow path is due to their influence. Now this by itself is alright. We all got our weird beliefs but he did try to exercise my other cousin once. Her demon had apparently gotten her to smoke a big fat joint and as such she was completely unprepared for the experience. There was screaming and tears. One last thing, Meg and Tiffany, despite their good traits, which will remain unmentioned, are very judgmental and pushy. They got a stringent idea of how one should live and if you deviate from it, prepare for an annoying and self-righteous lecture, a few bible verses and possibly an exorcism. It's better than hell, they would say, but not so, I reply. Here is the good part, I don't see Meg and Tiffany very often, but this summer I happened to visit my grandparents while they were in town, I had forgotten what they can be like until we sat down to catch up. Up. They asked me about grad school and my boyfriend of six years. My answer seemed to confuse them in some way. It quickly became apparent that they were leading the conversation in a particular direction. First they wanted to know why we were not married and if we were living together in sin presumably. I parried. They asked why I was in grad school, it was gonna take so long and there are enough scientists anyway, why not just marry and settle down now? I evaded. They asked me when I was planning to have children. Sensing danger, I changed the subject immediately. You see, I'm one of these oddballs who is not interested in having children. To each their own, I say, but not for me. As you might imagine though, I was not about to tell them that without a fight. And of course, they gave me a fight. You have to get started soon. You know your ex start dying when you're like 25. It's so sad when a young woman doesn't have children, she doesn't know what she's missing. God told us to go forth and multiply. You know it's your duty to him, don't you? Their words had some sort of effect on me. I'm not sure what it was, but I momentarily lost my senses. I figured they would keep pestering me until they got a response and I might as well just say it and be done with them. I was out of practice with relatives and my usual trick of pretending to need a bathroom break never crossed my mind. So then I took the plunge and told them I would rather do things with my life than have a baby. I regretted it immediately and had the impression of staring at a shocked and angry bull who is convinced I've just bitten it on the behind. However, my cousin actually yelled at me. I'm a selfish and short-sighted person who doesn't know what it means to be a woman and I will die alone. Also, God is disappointed in me. I am a waste of a human because what's the point of life without children? And also that I will never know love. I'd better change my mind. And then arguments ensued. A wild aunt chimed in to tell me the same things. I don't remember how exactly it ended, but as you might imagine, I was miffed. 
A couple of days later, I think I've forgotten the whole thing. After all, that's just how Mac is and it is not personal. But I have omitted one important detail so far. Tiffany was pregnant with their second child, a discussion of potential baby names arose and I saw an opportunity. An opportunity hinging on the basic assumption that while these people may be annoyingly self-righteous, they are not complete idiots. Though maddeningly pushy, I had no reason to suspect that they were actually particularly stupid. Spoiler alert, I I may have been wrong. Anyway, baby names were being discussed. Various relatives made suggestions. They said they liked old sounding bible names, which makes sense because kid number one already has a bit of a weird one. I'm not even sure what name made me think of it, but I told them I had always liked the name Nephron, which is the name of an ancient Roman emperor who is known for his piety and for helping bring Christianity to Rome in the early days. I half expected one of my aunts or maybe my dad to call me on my BS because they are all Christians and some of them know a bit about early Christian history, but nobody did. Mac asked me how to spell it and where I knew about it from. The first thing that popped into my mind was a book on early Christianity that I read in undergrad. Which earned me a funny look from my dad, the only one in the room who knows I'm not religious. However, he said nothing. Eventually Mac and Tiffany thanked me for my suggestion and the discussion moved on. I figured if they were at all interested in naming their kid Nephron, they would look it up, figure out I was effing with them and either laugh it off or get mad but pick another name. Fast forward to a couple of weeks ago. I just got an email they sent around to everyone announcing the birth. They are overjoyed apparently to welcome Abraham Nephron Jackson into the world. They had not googled it, they had not done basic research on this name that they were giving their child. Maybe Mac thinks the internet is a tool of Satan. Anyway, Nephron is not the name of a pious Roman emperor, it's actually the functional unit of a kidney suggested in a light rage by someone who was annoyed at Mac for his pushiness. Nephron filters urine and this kid and his parents are stuck with that for life. To anyone thinking I should feel bad, I do, a little bit. But not enough to tell anyone though. And yeah guys, I gotta say, even though that is brilliant revenge, I do feel a little bit bad for the kid. However, then again, I'm not sure if you're really stuck with that name for life, because in many countries, you can change your name legally. Anyway, if you enjoyed the story, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel for daily content. And now let's get back to the next story. Nightmare neighbor ran me off the road inside our neighborhood, I crashed my car. I never expected that I would not only have to file a restraining order against someone, but also take them to court. However, the past year has surprised me, as it did most of us. A little backstory, before we get to the juicy part of this whole ordeal, I live in a nice gated community and have enjoyed my career as a school principal. Many people in the community know me and I would like to think that I have a wonderful relationship with my kids and their parents. I have never in my life been harassed or threatened until I met the neighbor across the street. She was not new to the community but she had just moved houses. We lived in a smaller town so mostly everyone knew each other through mutual friends and whatnot. As soon as the lady across the street moved in, her behavior became more and more erratic and aggressive after she found out I was the principal of the biggest school in town. At first I thought that it was something personal against me. I would leave for work in the morning and she would flip me her middle finger. On one of these occasions she even started yelling profanities at me when I began backing out of my driveway. She had never directly said these things to my face or been aggressive, but her actions spoke very loudly. On another occasion, the next door neighbor who was a substitute teacher in the school district had come over to chat with my husband and me. All three of us were sitting on our porch when we saw the lady across the street pacing up and down the sidewalk with her phone pointed towards us. It had appeared that she was videotaping us and honestly, I was glad there was another witness to this behavior. I had not spoken to anyone about her aggressive and strange behavior because our community is mostly tight-knit and I did not want to be the one to cause any drama or animosity. However, with my other neighbor present, I learned that I was not the only one. This neighbor had some issues with her as well after the lady found out she was a substitute teacher. I had seen some kids in her house and playing in the yard several times and I wondered if she had an issue with a teacher or school staff that led to this behavior that she seemed to have towards teachers, me or the school or the staff. 
There were many more instances of this weird behavior, such as her videotaping my daughter walking our dog or in another instance we were sitting inside our living room and we saw her walk her dog from across the street to do its business on our lawn. Her behavior was getting more and more weird and I knew eventually we would have to do something. This was not okay and while normally I would address the problem being direct and confront her, there was just something very off-putting about her. Well, turns out that I would have to do something sooner than later because about a week later she purposely tried to hit me head on and caused me to crash my car, completely destroying it. And yes, you read that right, I was coming home from running errands on a weekend and while I was turning onto my street there was the crazy neighbor coming out of her driveway. However, she did not seem to be following the natural path of the road. As a matter of fact, she was heading towards me. As I realized what was happening, she speeded up and I ended up swerving my car out of instinct. This led to me crashing my car into a street pole on the sidewalk. I was terribly shaken up about the whole thing and many neighbors came to see what all the commotion was about. By then she had speeded off and was of course nowhere to be found. What makes this whole ordeal even worse is that my son and daughter were playing in the front yard which means they saw everything. The neighbors called the police officers when my husband tried to calm me down, while comforting our kids at the same time. The whole situation was absolutely chaos and it was the last straw for me. Upon the police arriving I had let them know about the previous instances of her behavior. This is not the first time that someone had called the police officers on her. As a matter of fact I learned that various school staff and school district employees have had several issues with her already. One of them being a school bus driver who had reported her after she threatened to choke him in front of a school bus full of kids. I also learned that in another school she had been banned after causing a scene in front of teachers and staff which led them to buckle up on security presence on the campus. I ended up filing a restraining order against her which ended up giving me a major peace of mind. She was not allowed to contact me by any means nor was she allowed to be 500 feet of my home. Which means that she had to move. Not only that but she was also ordered not to come within 500 feet of my workplace which was considered the entire school district. Although I never found out why she was so hostile and threatening towards school staff and employees, I was just damn glad she could not come near me or my family and hopefully she would never be allowed to. And with this we have reached the end of the video, however if you cannot get enough of my content then please don't forget to check out my endless playlist which has thousands of videos and hours and hours of content. In addition please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on the bell to not miss any of my daily uploads. Thank you so much and I will see you again tomorrow.